This is Prime Time on Money FM 89.3. I'm Howie Lim. Now, the government's been swift in its response to the COVID 19 virus, allocating 4 billion Singapore dollars in its 2020 budget to firms to help them weather its impact, as well as the general economic slowdown carried over from the US China trade war. In a second package, is in the works. While the full impact of the virus has yet to run its course, it's also prudent to perhaps stop worrying about things we have no control over, spend the time looking to the future and getting prepared for when the clouds do clear. And joining us today with his thoughts on thinking long-term, transformation opportunities and innovation is Senior Minister of State for Trade and Industry, Dr. Ko Po Kun. Dr. Ko, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Howie. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me from over there? We've yeah. had to obviously do the social distancing and make sure we're one meter apart, but we're happy that you're here with us today. I know it's busy times for you. So let's dive straight into it, shall we? Mm-hmm. Talk about innovation first up. So how will innovation ensure that Singapore's small and open economy remains nimble and able to respond to change- changes in global trends like what's happening now? Well, the, um, the longer term competitive advantage for companies and for Singapore's economy as a whole will have to be driven by innovation. How can we put more innovative and competitive offerings in terms of products and services to continue to capture opportunities? I think that's where innovation must play a key driving role, a driving force for economic transformation. Mm. Why is it particularly important, you think, for the SME sector, especially at this time, to foster that spirit of innovation? SMEs are an important pillar of our economy as well. Um, they actually also play a very strong partnership role with many of our MNCs, being part of the ecosystem, supplying services or intermediate products to our MNCs. And actually, in today's uh, economy, SMEs that who are innovative actually can capture a bigger share of the market overseas as well. Uh, just take digitalization, for example. We know e-commerce is here to stay and in fact is projected to grow much more you know, in, even in ASEAN. So SMEs who are digitized, who can jump onto the bandwagon of the digital economy, can actually then tap into overseas markets without physically having to leave the shores of Singapore. Mm. So in fact, digitalization and technology allows SMEs now to internationalize much more easily. Help us out though, Dr. Ko. A lot of the times I think when we hear the word innovate, we think, oh no, we have to be in a lab and come up with something that's even better than the wheel or something to that effect. Give us a few examples of how maybe small and simple innovations are what will make a business thrive. Mm, I think innovation doesn't have to be um, earth-shattering. Even incremental innovation can be something of advantage to an SME. And I think for the SMEs, a lot of them would have this worry about bandwidth and they don't have the necessary expertise. Uh, They don't have R&D scientists or team to do so because they are very lean to begin with. This is where trying to solve this problem, in this year's budget, we announced that Simtech, which is an A-star institute that helps uh, SMEs to come up with manufacturing solutions. Mm, the Simtech, facilities that are in the pipeline precisely. to help them out. So Simtech mm. started an innovation factory, and we are going to launch this innovation factory as a pilot-scale production line where SMEs can work with the technicians, the technologists from Simtech to help them to you know, do product design, come up with prototypes, and then do a pilot production to see the viability of this product and if it's something that the SME feels that there is market potential, we can then try and bring this into one of our model factories that we launched a couple of years ago Mm. to try and put in place a scale-up version of the production line. So SMEs, without investing in heavy infrastructure, KPEX, can actually tap onto this resident expertise in in ASTAR to actually start to look at new ways to do do things differently. So the Simtech Innovation Factory, is it aimed at a particular sector? Because there's another one that's in the pipeline, the Agri-Food Innovation Park at Sungai Kadu. That's obviously for the agri-food tech sector. So Simtech Innovation Factory, I think, would be really targeted towards the SMEs because the bigger MNCs usually will have their own R&D teams. But SMEs are the ones without the capabilities or the bandwidth or the expertise to do so. This is what the Simtech Innovation Factory is trying to fill, this particular gap itself. Mm. But for SMEs, they are probably a little bit further along that journey of innovation and product innovation. We have existing schemes like ASTAR's T-Up and GetUp scheme, where we actually second research scientists, technicians, engineers into SMEs. And I visited quite a few SMEs in Singapore that actually look at things like, uh, they're looking at lenses and uh, optics. And by working with ASTAR, having the researchers actually embedded in their company's operations, 
some of these SMEs actually leveraging on ASTAR's capability are able to own IPs, uh, you know, and have new products that they carve out a real niche for themselves, a, a distinct competitive advantage. So, Dr. Ko, for some time I also spoke with Spring Singapore before it became Enterprise Singapore in its attempts to help out SMEs in their digital transformation journey. And a lot of SMEs are also a little afraid of being subsumed by, say, if we get a scientist seconded to our place, will we ultimately lose our IP, for example? Mm. At least some of those fears. Well, the, the happy news about that company that I visited was that the A-star scientist was seconded to them and eventually, actually, we allowed the scientists to be employed by the SME. Oh, lovely. So the so SME him, now <laughs> kind of owns the, the scientists and the IP at the same time. Yeah. And I think our aim is to help SMEs grow the capability. We're more than happy if the SME can take over the scientists and grow their own R&D arm within that company. In other words, the SME has gained a new capability. And the agri-tech uh, uh, sector that you talk about is another area in which we want to encourage uh, new innovation, uh, new startups, you know, every SME starts as a startup and at some point, we hope they grow into a, a much bigger enterprise. Mm. And also food security reasons Absolutely. too. Absolutely. I think this recent COVID virus issue has also sharpened the awareness of Singaporeans to the need to be more resilient in our own food supply. So growing a food innovation system, uh, having more urban farms, for example, will add that measure of uh, resilience to our own food supply. What about businesses in other sectors? I wasn't quite sure whether you said Simtech Innovation Factory would be catered to all sectors uh, that SMEs are in? Yeah. So, for example, um, will other businesses in other sectors get some deep tech help as well by way of facilities? For example, might the Startup SG Equity Scheme help? That's been upped as well. Mm -hmm. So, the Startup SG Equity Scheme is meant to attract uh, investors, VCs, for example, venture caps, who will come and actually uh, work with our startups. And many startups, especially those in the deep tech sector, require not just money, but they require expertise. Because a lot of times for deep technology, they require regulatory approvals. For example, if you're looking at medical technology devices, you, the startups would then have to make a good prototype. The prototype may have to undergo clinical trials and get uh, enough clinical data for safety and efficacy. And then the product has to go for FDA approval, CE marking if you want to enter Europe markets. And finally, of course, in Singapore, you need HSA approval. Mm. So there is quite a lot of uh, kind of regulatory hoops they have to jump through. So apart from just money and investment, they do require some degree of expertise to help them navigate and to actually go through the different milestones. This is where having a, a scheme that attracts smart VCs, VCs that come not just with money, but with expertise, VCs that come also with a network of uh, global network of people who can connect them to the right markets, the right partners, will be very useful for our startups in this space to actually thrive and grow. Sort of like an accelerator almost. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. so innovation though is one thing, but I think it might be challenging for some SMEs now because innovation is also a lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. some fear to fail, they can't fail quick enough and then just jump back on their feet. How do you think we can shift this mindset I think Mindset the shift seems absolutely. to be the most challenging. Uh, yes. The first thing about tackling something new and or trying something new is first not to be afraid to fail. But of course, there has to be a strategy to failure as well. You can't just throw good money after bad money and then eventually okay. succumb to that <laughs> kind of... Or just throw money at the situation absolutely. to solve it. Right? So the question is about... Uh, the, the key thing is about recognising when to stop throwing good money after bad ones mm. and then say, well, I think I got to cut my losses. Maybe this was a good idea, but it wasn't quite ready in yet. Theory, I got to try okay. something else. <laughs> yeah. uh, and sometimes actually being in an ecosystem of uh, fellow entrepreneurs, um, bouncing off ideas would help you to sharpen that sense a bit better. And this is where having an ecosystem of accelerators and incubators, uh, people who has experience actually bringing startups and, and new ideas to the market can provide a form of guidance to help you maybe navigate this space quicker and not walk any unnecessary paths and detours. Mm. We're talking with Senior Minister of State for Trade and Industry, Dr. Ko Po Kun. Let's talk about how you must be heartened to see some different stakeholders come together to be more collaborative. For example, the Singapore Business Federation, along with V3 Fintech, have set up the Academy Beyond Lab. How else do you hope that different entities from the public and private sector can come together? We're seeing quite, uh, quite a good trajectory and quite a good response from um, various stakeholders in the industry, from trade associations, multinationals, and then working with startups and as well as SMEs, together with Venture Cap, coming together to try and uh, catalyze the e uh, innovation ecosystem. So that's something good and we'll try to encourage that. 
Uh, and I think it's important that in this whole space, we continue to reduce any kind of regulatory hurdles that would stifle innovation. Mm. So, so I think government should play a catalytic role. But it's important that people who are stakeholders in this uh, have opportunity to interact and to, to let the ideas bounce. A lot of times, uh, innovation and inventions are actually quite serendipitous. It mm. is something that you may be moving in one direction, but you found something quite accidental. and then But that became the dominant idea. And what you started with was probably overtaken and superseded wayside, by yeah. something else. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about then business transformation and upskilling as well. That's come to the fore as well, especially with Budget 2020. Mm-hmm. So long-term goals to grow and expand your business, let's say, for an SME owner through deep industry transformation. How can they go about doing that? The, the first thing for businesses uh, going transformation is to have a clear business goal. I think transformation must have an objective. You know, it's not just transformation for the sake of transformation. Here's so, the thing too though, Dr. Yeah. Koh. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So hence the expertise, right, needs yes. to be brought in. I think it's important then for uh, SMEs to be, you know, not struggling or, or I mean for businesses not to be struggling in this alone. Um, but being part of a, a network of, say, companies within a trade association, for example, uh, an industry association usually would have a clearer sense of where the industry is heading for the medium and longer term. So if everybody in the industry tends to see that this is the trajectory, they can't be all wrong at the same time. So so you get a better insight on where things are heading, right? And in that process, it helps to guide all your sense of where your competitor, competitors are moving, where the larger industry trends are moving so that you, you can formulate a more you know, targeted strategy for your own company. How do you want to tackle the competition? How do you want to ride the waves of uh, industry change and transformation? Uh, rather than try and transform in a vacuum, you at least have a, a more coherent plan. But the idea is to, to have a plan, if you don't have a plan, you don't really know how you want to get from point A to point B. But once True. you have a plan, the question then, how do you make that plan? Uh, how do you execute that plan and get it in, into some tangible outcomes? This is where a system of transformation is needed. Uh, and there are, there are kind of uh, things that we, we have actually rolled out in the last year or so. Uh, the NTUC, for example, we started advocating a company training committee. And this is actually some over three hundred companies have come so together, far, haven't they? Indeed, mm. and the idea is to bring together companies' management, um, your C-suite, and and your key uh, company decision makers, your HR, your ops guy, your COO, your finance guy, um, together with the with a worker representative, and in a unionized company, that would be the branch chairperson. The idea is to have them come together through a more um, you know maybe systematic process of looking at what your business goals are. And one of the ways you can do this is using the ops tech road mapping process that ASTAR has been championing in the last few years. What it does is help company to say, well, if I want to get this product out in three years or five years, or if I want to go into a new market in the next three to five years, then how, feasible, are how you do ready? I work backwards and say, if I want to get there in three years, what are the steps I need to do now? And for all these things I need to do, what does each and every department of the company have to do in lockstep with each other so that together as a whole, we can reach the end point together. Mm. So it is really going down to the nuts and bolts, the very, very detailed steps of planning. And finally, of course, translating this to a series of skills that your workers need and then looking at what kind of training that is needed. So it is very detailed. It is really like planning a PSLE syllabus. If you want to pass PSLE by year six, you have to start learning this in year one and then train, you know, the skills and knowledge. And it may get be less there. painful too <laughs> if we did it in a step by step process. And I think rather, engaging less the overwhelming, workers, yes. engaging the workers as well, so they know why they are training for something, mm. why they are going through this learning process, because there's a there's an objective in mind. Dr. So Ko, QBE Insurance though recently uh, did a survey and it revealed that only thirty one percent of SMEs utilize government support available for say digitalization. And then seventy one percent said they knew of them, and yet this gap is so huge. How do you think that we can get SMEs to move? The the first thing is that the SMEs must realize that they ought to change and they need to keep up with what the competition is doing. Um, I don't think it is really a choice at all, basically, because actually the whole world is actually transforming and moving, albeit now a little bit distracted by the COVID virus issue that is kind of slowing things down a little bit. But the longer term trend is that the competition will continue to move uh, towards using more technology and more innovative products coming onto the market for for competitive advantage. So bearing that long term trend in mind, I think it's then important that SMEs continue to realise that uh, they have to have a plan in place. How do they want to capture opportunities? 
SMEs that may not have a clear idea where they should start can actually go to our SME centres. There are about 12 or 13 distributed across the different parts of the island. Um, they can go there and seek a consultation and say, well, this is my current business model. Um, is there anything I should at least do as a low-hanging fruit to kind of extract some productivity advantage? Anecdotally, or, some of them have told me that they're afraid of this diagnostic, almost, you know, open-eye surgery type look <laughs> that these SME centre advisors will come in and have on their businesses. But that's really something a painful process that you have to go through if you want to improve, isn't it's it? It's like a patient going for a health yeah. check, right? Some patients say, well, I don't want to go for a health screening in case the doctors find something the wrong one. with me. <laughs> Which is very counterintuitive. Almost. Yeah, but you know, the, the point is that if, if you don't go for a health check, it doesn't mean the health problems won't catch up with That's you. That's true. And so if you don't go to an SME centre and get a sense of what is wrong with your business, what you could do better, eventually your competition will overtake you and you still mm. have the better consequences. So, so you can't just be an ostrich and put your head in the sand and pretend and the world is not moving. Okay. Yeah, true, Absolutely. true. Let's talk about, though, the current situation and some SMEs or businesses feel so they're just perpetually firefighting mm. and th- they're in that mode right now, making sure salaries are paid, making sure they don't go under even. What sort of advice do you have for these business owners? I can really empathise with the fact that SMEs have limited bandwidth and sometimes they don't eat, they're quite lean, actually, for, us, for some of them. So to tackle on extra challenges could be really a a big one for them. And especially now with the COVID-19 situation, they're all hands on deck. But you often also hear companies saying that when times are good, they're too busy taking orders, they're trying to fulfil customer requirements, they're too busy to think about other things except to, you know, meet the needs of the consumers and the customers. Then now when times are bad, they they also don't have orders, so now they're struggling with something different. But I think in that case, then really there's no no perfect time. There's no real good time. And I would say that uh, given the current situation, uh, this situation impacts everybody. Everybody's affected by it. And be that as it may, I think the, the company that is able to spare some bandwidth to try and, um, you know, in this downtime to do something to, to boost the capability for the longer term, will find that when the, when the storm is over and you emerge from this crisis, you will be probably better positioned hmm. to try and capture new opportunities. Uh, because otherwise you will just be weakened by the situation. The question is how can you be strengthened in the midst of a crisis and that's something that we all got to think about. Dr. Koh, allow me to ask you a personal question. You are an MD. What concerns you about the situation most now? I I think the the key thing is for all of us to be vigilant and take personal precautions. Um, I think if people are all vigilant, they, they do the personal hygiene, they do social distancing, if all of us can be socially responsible, I think this virus can be tackled. But if all of us are, you know, um, in the blasé and we let our gut gut down and we try, we still come to work when we're sick, for example, Mm. then I think we put everyone in danger. So I think it's about personal responsibility first and and, um, keep yourself healthy. Senior Minister of State for Trade and Industry, Dr. Ko Po Kun. Dr. Ko, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Harvey.